great to be here in the mecca of the mecca of tech. Um, I, I really enjoyed the the ferment of I, the cross fertilization of ideas. I'm not a techie. I'm a writer. So I was just a writer in search of a good subject. Uh, and I'd written 10 books on health and the politics of health and the suppression of natural alternative remedies. And I realized in the course of all that that if we wanted to get control of um, the, or how we would rein in these corporate giants that were basically exploiting us, uh, big money got their power from uh, the power of banking, that banks actually create our money. Uh, not governments as we normally think. So, so this was a mind-blowing revelation, but what I didn't really know was what I could add to the subject until I discovered that The Wizard of Oz was actually written as a monetary allegory in the 1890s. So this was my theme and my hook, and I, so I wove this whole book around The Wizard of Oz. Um, it's, a, it's a quite strange plot for a children's story if you think about it, this motley crew going off to uh, um, the Emerald City to, to seek help from a wizard who proves to be a little man behind a curtain turning novels, uh, knobs and dials. Uh, well, what it was patterned after was the first ever march on Washington in 1894. It was the march of Coxey's army. Uh, they went all the way from Ohio to Washington, D.C., seeking a return to Abraham Lincoln's greenback system. This was at a time when we were suffering from a depression that was nearly as bad as the depression of the 1930s. And it was over the same thing, a contraction of the money supply. Uh, during the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln had foiled the bankers by uh, issuing his own money rather than borrowing at usurious interest rates. And in fact, what he had done was just go back to what the American colonists had done, which was issue our own money. And it's what we most, most people think that Got the government does create our money, but it doesn't. It's, um, it's the banks, and I'll show that in a minute. Um, so that was one theme of The Wizard of Oz. Uh, Frank Baum, who wrote The Wizard of Oz, was a, um, a, money, a populist. Mar he marched for William Jennings Bryan with the populist. But he was also a theosophist, which was, it was all the rage in the 1890s. It was this new cosmology that had been imported from India. And the, the basic concept of uh, theosophy is that reality is a construct of the mind, that you are what you believe, that um, uh, basically you, we can have it all. It's abundance is within us. We just have to realize it or make it real. Uh, so, the, so the scarecrow already had a brain. The scarecrow represented the farmers who had lost their farms. The tin man already had a, a heart. The Tin Man represented the factory workers who, who were out of work. Uh, the Lion already had courage, etc. that they just had to realize it or make it real. So here we are, a century later, again going through a depression, again feeling that we're in this great period of scarcity and want and austerity. Everybody's broke. The individuals are gro broke. The governments are gro broke. Governments everywhere are broke. How is that possible that everybody is in debt? Who are they in debt to? They're in debt to the banks. So this is actually just a, it's an artificial scarcity. And if we reboot the computer, we can, um, we can restore the abundance that we actually have. I don't really have time to prove that banks create our money, but th this chart on the right, I think, sums it up pretty well. That's the... Uh, the money supply going up to 2006, which is when they quit re uh, reporting M3, the, it's still there. They just don't report it anymore. So M1 is the blue line, sort of purple line, and that's coins, dollar bills, and checkbook money. So coins and dollar bills are um, halfway up the blue line, and that's, at best, that's what the government issues. And you can argue about the dollar bills because they're actually issued by the 12 Federal Reserve branches, all of which are 100% owned by the banks in their district. But in either case, you can see that most of the money is created somewhere else. That's the electronic money created by banks, by double-entry bookkeeping. Um, they do it just by writing, 
writing money into the borrower's account, and so they write it as an asset on one side of their books to themselves and a liability on the other side. But what they don't take, it, what they don't create when they create this principle, they don't create the interest. So over the course of, say, th a 30-year loan, you pay back as much in interest, or more sometimes, than you, than you got in the principle. So banks generally put out $1,000, take back $2,000, put out $2,000, take back $4,000. It's an unsustainable pyramid scheme. Uh, this chart on the left is our uh, federal debt at, at the same period, going up to the same period. You can see that the federal debt and the money supply are about the same thing. In fact, our money is debt, and if we didn't have a federal debt, we wouldn't have a money supply as currently structured. Um, it's actually the interest that makes the debt unsustainable. This chart was put out by a group that was arguing that we have to get rid of entitlements, that it's the entitlements that are killing us. But th that, that part of the debt, you can see, is pretty steady. That's like the, the bottom half. That, that's actually a sustainable debt. It's the interest, the yellow thing, that's driving it into an exponential curve. If we had been borrowing from our own central bank all along, assuming banks create money, if we had the bank, if it was a publicly owned bank, in other words, if it was our own central bank or in the states our own state bank, we would get the interest back. We would be borrowing it interest free and we could have cut out that whole yellow, yellow block. That, that's actually going up to 2080. But, um, and you can see here in this chart that on the left, that's our federal debt today. That's $15 trillion. The, the gray column is uh, what we paid in interest just in the last 24 years, according to the Federal Reserve's website. So that's 8.2 trillion we paid in interest. If we had been borrowing from our own central bank, which created the money on its books in the same way that banks do, uh, we would have saved that and we would not be in debt. We would have plenty of money to do all the things we think we want to do. Or it, in, the one in the middle is France, going back to um, 1973. They have actually paid as much in interest on their debt as their debt is today. So again, if they had been borrowing from their own central bank, they could have no debt today. And Canada has paid twice as much on their debt, going back to 1961 in interest, as the debt is today. So again, it's the interest that's killing us. If we own, the way to get rid of our in interest is to own the bank, and then you get the interest back, so it becomes sustainable. This is a chart of California's revenue bonds uh, that go to 158 billion. The interest is 70 billion. So we think that we're we're always in deficit. We can't balance the the budget, even though we've done this horrible, uh, this radical cutbacks, but. If we had been borrowing from our own state-owned bank all along so that the profits went back to the state, we would be $70 billion richer and we would have plenty of money to do all the things we want to do. So there's actually one state that does, th uh, does this, that owns its own bank. That's North Dakota, uh, the Bank of North Dakota. Um, it's the only state that escaped the credit crisis totally. Not only do they have no debt, but they have had a nice surplus every year since 2008 when the crisis hit. Uh, they had the lowest unemployment rate in the country, the lowest default rate on loans. They haven't lost a bank in over a decade. That's as far back as they report. Uh, so you can see that, that what they do is they partner with the local banks. They don't compete. They're sort of a banker's bank. They help with capital requirements. They help with liquidity requirements. So it's a sustainable system where the, the money goes back to the to the economy rather than being uh, siphoned off to Wall Street, to the coupon clippers. They get, the, they get the coupons, they get the interest, and it goes back into the economy. Um, some people say that North Dakota, the only reason it's doing well is it has oil, but other states have oil and they're not doing so well. And if you look globally, 40% of um, banks globally are publicly owned. We never hear about this, but they are. And it's mostly in the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, which um, have 40% of the global population. And these are the countries that are doing remarkably well right now. They're showing remarkable growth. They've grown 92% in the last decade compared to 15% for Western economies. 
and you can see they're going to overtake us soon. And it's largely, or partly at least, because of their banking system, which is sustainable. It, it feeds the economy rather than feeding off the economy. So that's what we're excited about at the Public Banking Institute. Um, we try to promote this idea. There, there are now 17 states that have bills pending of one sort or another for publicly owned banks, or that have introduced bills for publicly owned banks. Um, but w we could really use the, your, your tech experience. Um, it, when you go to legislators, you know, they'll say that's a nice idea, but they don't really take action unless you can hold their hand and show them step by step. This is what you have, this is how much money you have. This is where your money is going right now. It is not serving you, it is serving Wall Street. You could be taking that money, investing it in your own bank, and this is what it would cost you, this is how long it would take you to be making a profit, this is how much profit you can make, this is what you could do with it. So what we need are computer modeling, um, data mining, data, all those things that have been talked about today, um, book or uh, double, in, you know, accounting, <laughs> that was the word I was looking for. Yeah, um, so, so um, that if we, if we could get all those tools in place, we could make a case, that, that a lead pipe case for, um, for public banks. And our legislators, even here in California, we got, our bill got passed both houses of the legislature, and then uh, Jerry Brown didn't, didn't, um, didn't sign because he, he wasn't in favor of more committees. So now another bill has just been introduced recently that's actually for a bank, not for, for a study. So, so they're very close, and they just need this extra, th this data, this demonstration of data that, that would be so compelling that, that they'll just say, all right, th I mean, it's, it's a no-brainer, it's obvious we have to do it. So I hope to have inspired you <laughs> to possibly join us in this, this campaign. Thank you very much.